Number 15. Please, please don't kill me. I don't want to die. I just want to have my baby. Sharon Tate. The Manson family is embedded in people's minds as malevolence for their string of murders in the Los Angeles area between May and August 1969. Leader Charles Manson believed there would be a race war between blacks and whites, after which he would be the sole surviving white man to lead the New World, a scenario he dubbed Helter Skelter. Manson ordered his followers to begin Helter Skelter at the home of Sharon Tate and film director Roman Polanski. Tate was hosting guests at her home when members of the Manson family invaded and murdered everyone in the house. Tate's last words related to her being two weeks away from her due date and attempting to use this information to change her killer's minds. Manson and the followers who committed the attacks remain incarcerated in Californian prisons and will spend the remainder of their lives behind bars. Number 14. I do not care if I live or die. Go ahead and kill me. Jeffrey Dahmer. Dahmer is said to be one of the most prolific serial killers in American history, having killed 17 people before his arrest. He would lure gay men into his apartment for sex, alcohol, and drugs, and kill them. The corpses would be kept for long periods of time so Dahmer could commit necrophilia and bizarre experiments, including injecting acid into living people's brains in an attempt to make a zombie sex slave. Dahmer disposed of the corpses via acid in a blue drum he kept in his apartment and would keep body parts as trophies in his fridge. Dahmer was sentenced to life imprisonment in May 1992 and sent to Columbia Correctional Institution in Wisconsin. On November 28, 1994, Dahmer accompanied fellow inmates Jess Anderson and Christopher Scarva on work detail cleaning the prison showers. While unsupervised, Scarva attacked Anderson and Dahmer with a metal bar before returning to his cell. He claimed God had told him to kill his fellow inmates and showed no remorse for doing so. Scarver claimed Dharma uttered his final words, then remained silent as he was being bludgeoned to death. Number 13. Hello, there's three of us. Two broken windows. Oh God. Oh, Kevin Cosgrove. September 11th, 2001. September 11th, 2001 has become one of those days people will remember exactly what they were doing the exact moment they found out the planes had crashed. Two planes struck both World Trade Centers in New York City, followed by a third crashing into the Pentagon 40 minutes later. In all, 2,977 people lost their lives, along with 19 hijackers. Kevin Cosgrove was a 46-year-old insurance man and was trapped on the 105th floor of the South Tower and spoke to 911 dispatchers in his final moments. He was speaking with his wife before his tower was struck, assuring her he was evacuating. Moments later, the second plane hit and he became trapped on his floor with several co-workers. His chilling last words are accompanied by the roar of the collapsing tower until the line abruptly cuts off. The audio of the conversation is available online and will echo in one's ear as a reminder of the malevolent actions committed that day. Hello? Hello? We're looking at all the financial center. Two three of us, two broken windows. Oh, God! Number 12. All is dark and doubtful. Edward Gibbon. A famous British historian and member of parliament, Gibbon is best known for his work, History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Six volumes of history published between 1776 and 1788, full of irony within its writing and use of primary sources. The books also shared open criticism of organized religion, thus granting Gibbon the label of an atheist. Gibbon acted as a representative for Lymington in Parliament as a member of the Whig Party and further wrote on history throughout his life. His final words are enough to scare anybody, the fear of there being nothing but darkness after we die. However, another interpretation was that it's his view on the future, since he had been a historian his entire life, which could have darkened his outlook on humanity. Whichever the meaning behind them, there is a haunting element to the man's last words, and it's something that provokes thought. Number 11. Until this moment, I thought there was neither God nor hell. Now I know and feel that there are both, and I am doomed to perdition by the just judgment of the Almighty. Sir Thomas Scott Scott was the Chancellor of England during the late 1500s and was a known critic of Catholicism during his life. The eerie idea of not knowing what happens after death is something that encompasses all of us and is a thought that comes to mind in everyone from time to time. These chilling last words emphasize on our fear of being wrong, whether it's someone who is a theist, seeing nothing but black during his or her final breaths, 
or a non-believer seeing visions of his or her ascension to heaven or descent into hell. Many religious people have taken this quote as confirmation of heaven and hell, and it was certainly enough confirmation for Scott as he passed away, his fears of doing so forever recorded in history. Number 10. Show my head to the people. It's well worth seeing. Georges Danton. The French Revolution led to a time of turmoil in French society in the latter half of the 1700s, filled with conflict and death. Danton was the first president of the Committee of Public Safety and is credited with many historians as being the driving figure in the overthrow of the monarchy in order to establish the first French Republic. A member of the radical Jacobins, Danton oversaw the many executions of people the committee declared enemies of the revolution during the early stages of the Reign of Terror, including Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. He later attempted to shift the revolution's direction and began collaborating with Camille Desmoulins in an attempt to end the terror and reform the committee. Danton and Desmoulins were tried together for their opposition to the committee and executed by guillotine. Danton's last words were a reference to how gleeful the audience would be over his death and suggested to be a last remark of disdain to the bloody thirsty actions committed during the chaotic period. Number 9. We're burning up. Roger Chaffee. Apollo 1 was the first planned low-Earth orbital test in the Apollo program and was scheduled to launch on February 21, 1967. Three astronauts, Edward H. White, Virgil Gus Grissom and Roger Chaffee were chosen for the flight and were undergoing training for the flight between June 1966 and January 1967. On January 27, the crew were performing plug-out countdown demonstration tests at Cape Kennedy, now Canaveral, where a fire broke out in the capsule. The crew were being fed pure oxygen, fueling the fire, and the increased air pressure inside made opening the doors virtually impossible. The pressure finally burst open the door and the fire decreased in severity, but by then all three astronauts perished due to smoke inhalation. Chaffee was found still strapped in his seat, as his job was to maintain communication in the event of an emergency. His last words were the final ones spoken to the control room before the radio cut out and sealing the fate of all three men. Number 8. All right, good night, Malaysia Airlines 370. On the night of March 8, 2014, Malaysian Airlines Flight 370 dissipated over the Indian Ocean while en route from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing. The plane was carrying 227 passengers and 12 crew members and suddenly vanished off the radar around 1.21 a.m. MYA, Malaysian Standard Time. The search became the most extensive and expensive search and rescue operations in aviation history and involved ships from the Malaysian, Australian, American, British, South Korean, Japanese and Chinese fleets combing the entire South China Sea and Southern Indian Ocean. After aircraft wreckage was discovered floating in the Sea of Bengal, the Malaysian government declared the flight had crashed with all lives lost. The final transmission from the cockpit was a friendly gesture between the pilot and controller only two minutes before MH370 vanished from the radar. The site of the crash remains unfound to this day. Number 7. Everyone Dances with the Grim Reaper Robert Harris An American criminal, Harris was convicted of kidnapping and murdering two teenage boys in San Diego and sentenced to death. He and his brother ordered the two boys to drive to a remote area and killed them, then used the boys' car as a getaway vehicle during a bank robbery. Fortunately, Harris was arrested two hours after the robbery, ironically by one of the fathers of the murdered teenagers. Before the murders, Harris had several run-ins with the law, including grand theft auto, manslaughter and robbery. But now he was to die for his most recent murders, all for wishing to obtain a getaway car. Harris spoke his last words as he waited in the gas chamber and is a misquote from the film Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. Despite the comedic nature of the film, the words from Harris's mouth echoed his dark nature and almost shows his lack of remorse for what he had done. Number 6. I'd just like to say I'm sailing with the rock and I'll be back, like Independence Day with Jesus, June the 6th, like the movie, Big Mothership and all, I'll be back. Eileen Warnos. Probably best known as the central character of the film Monster, Warnos murdered six men around Florida claiming she had killed them in self-defense because they attempted to rape her. Warnos was known for her erratic behavior inside and outside prison and would go on long, almost psychotic rants that lacked sense or reason. She maintained her self-defense claim until her final interview, while also claiming the media, police and society sabotaged my ass. After a final coffee, 
Warnows entered the execution chamber and shouted these final words, a reference to the film Independence Day. What is eerie about them is in her rant, it defined what sort of mindset she had and how far removed from reality she had become over the course of her life. She is the 10th woman to be executed since capital punishment was restored for federal crimes in 1976. Number 5. Useless, Useless John Wilkes Booth A popular theatre actor and Southern sympathizer, Booth witnessed the dream of an independent Confederacy die in 1865 when General Lee surrendered to Union forces. He and several other conspired to assassinate the then-President Abraham Lincoln after briefly considering kidnapping him. As Lincoln attended a performance of Our American Cousin, Booth burst into the president's seating area and shot Lincoln in the back of the head. He then leaped from the balcony and despite breaking his ankle, he escaped Washington DC on horseback. A large-scale manhunt ensued immediately. Booth and an accomplice made it as far as Garrett's farm, Maryland, where a man in custody revealed their location. Union troops surrounded the barn the men were hiding in and set it on fire to lure them out. The accomplice surrendered, but Booth held out and refused to be taken into custody. Sergeant Boston Corbett spotted Booth through a crack in the barn and shot him with his pistol. Booth was dragged from the barn, mortally wounded and paralyzed. He uttered, tell my mother I died for my country, then asked his hands to be raised so he could see him. He breathed his haunting final words in agony and died as the morning sun broke. Number 4. Dear God, dear God, why is this happening? I just want to go home. Cassie Bernal. The Columbine High School shooting on April 20, 1999 was undoubtedly one of the most horrific tragedies to befall the United States. On that day, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold entered their school and killed 12 students and one teacher during their 50-minute rampage, which included gunfire and explosives. The majority of the killings occurred in the school's library, where many students hid under their desk in hopes of escaping death or injury, and some even believing it was a senior prank. Bernal was hidden beneath one of the desks with fellow student Emily Wyant when the shooters began the killings. Bernal was a devout Christian, and there are misreports her last words were, yes, in response to Harris asking if she believed in God. Wyant stated Bernal spoke these last words to her, then Harris knocked on the desk, knelt down, and said, Peekaboo, before shooting the two girls. Number 3. Are you ready? Okay, let's roll. Todd Beamer. United Flight 93 was one of the flights hijacked on September 11, 2001, while it was en route from Newark to San Francisco. The hijackers rerouted the flight path towards Washington, D.C., with intentions of striking either the White House or Capitol Building, though neither target has been confirmed. Beamer was one of 33 passengers who collaborated to regain control of the aircraft from the four hijackers as it neared DC as Flight 93 was over Somerset County, Pennsylvania. During his final moments, Beamer was on his cell phone speaking to airphone supervisor Lisa Jefferson, and recordings reveal he asked, if I don't make it, please call my family and let them know how much I love them. Beamer recited the Lord's Prayer before turning to the others saying the final words, and then mounted the assault with the other passengers. While able to overpower at least a couple of the hijackers, the plane went down in a farmer's field and all lives were lost. Had it not been for the actions of these passengers, the death toll that day could have been a lot higher and another American landmark could have been lost or severely damaged. Number 2. Kiss My Ass John Wayne Gacy Gacy is described as one of America's most notorious serial killers, having killed up to 34 people between 1972 and 1978. Gacy would lure men into his home under the premise of sex or a better paying job before he'd rape, torture and murder them, then hide the bodies beneath his home in the crawl space. Friends and loved ones were none the wiser as he lived with a, as he lived with a busy schedule between working as a contractor and running the local junior chamber of commerce. Gacy was finally apprehended in December 1978 after an extensive investigation finally led detectives to the crawl space. He was found guilty of 33 counts of murder and sentenced to death by lethal injection. On May 10, 1994, his execution was carried out and he breathed these final words to his executioner before being given the lethal dosage. Some sources claim he followed with, you'll never find the rest, possibly in reference to more victims police had not yet discovered. Number 1. In keeping with Channel 40's policy of bringing you the latest in blood and guts and in living colour, you're about to see another first attempted suicide. Christine Chubak. 
The story behind this former news anchor is an amalgamation of shock and sadness. Chewbuck worked with WTOG in Cleveland, Ohio during the 60s and WXLT-TV in Florida from the late 60s to early 70s. She long struggled with depression and suicidal thoughts, even attempting to overdose on medication in 1970. In the weeks leading to her death, she had gotten approval by her station's news director to do a piece on suicide and was in the process of conducting research on the subject with police. It was one officer who revealed the most effective way of suicide. On July 15, 1974, Chewbuck spoke about three national stories, including a shooting at a restaurant in Saratosa, Florida. Footage of the scene jammed, which provided Chewbuck with the opportunity she was looking for. After saying these words to the audience, she lifted a revolver to her head and fired, before collapsing and violently shaking. She had even left notes to list her in critical condition, which her co-workers did later that day once the news returned. She passed away the next morning, and all film of her suicide has been destroyed. Got an idea for a top 15 list? Be sure to leave it in the comments below. Be sure to subscribe for future videos. Thanks for watching.